support the progress of Brother Mural. Certainly, we need to continue our prayer for him and for those who wish to help in the financial project to help support he and his family, please give your money to Karen or Jamie today. We extend our sympathy to the family of Joyce Presley in the passing of her brother's great-grandchild who died recently. Are there others that we should mention? We also announced Wednesday night that uh, we've been in contact with Brother Phil Sanders, who has obviously intricate knowledge of several folks who live in the Oklahoma area. Their immediate needs have been taken care of as far as food, water, blankets, and shelter, and so forth. But as many of you have seen on the news reports, help for these folks is going to be long-lasting, and in need, certainly long-lasting. So the eldership here has set aside the second Sunday of June, June the 9th, for those who wish to make a special contribution. We will collect that and other sister congregations are going to be uh, in association with us in this effort. So we've set aside the second Sunday of June, June the 9th, for those who wish to make a special contribution. You can make your contribution to the Bremen Church of Christ, designate that as Oklahoma Disaster Relief. We will forward all of this money to an eldership very close to the location of the tornado, a brother-in-law of which is Brother Phil Sanders. And he has assured me that these folks d d do a very good job in benevolence, and obviously this is not their first time in doing so. So we're confident that the money that will be sent to Oklahoma will be put to good use and under the oversight of a very capable eldership that can do so. So Sunday, June the 9th, it's been set aside for that event. For those teachers that were teaching last spring quarter, which today is the last Sunday, please uh, assemble your perfect attendance and get that to Jimmy or Jan as soon as possible. Brothers Keepers Group 3, Jake and Julie's group, will meet next Saturday, June the 1st at the home of Eric and Mary Blank, sign-up sheet in the foyer. Group 2, Rick and Cindy's group, will meet Sunday, June the 9th after the evening service at the home of Ken and Phyllis Glover, sign-up sheet in the foyer. Next Sunday, after the evening service, will be our summer quarter potluck kickoff of the summer quarter after the evening service. Groups three and four are asked to set up and make the tea and coffee. Groups one and two are asked to clean up after the event. Thursday, June the 6th will be the ladies Devo here at the building, 11 o'clock a.m. Bremen's week at camp will be quickly upon us June 16 through 22. If you have yet to register, you're asked to do so as soon as possible. Either grab an application in the foyer or do so online. Johnny will be available after services tonight to answer any questions that you may have about camp or help with registration. Two teachers for each VBS class, ages two through fifth grade are needed. We'd like for those two teachers to teach all week. For those who are willing and able to help in this effort, please see Jimmy or Jan as soon as possible. There'll be no area-wide singing this month. Lithia Springs has secured the area-wide singing for next month, June 28th, Friday, June 28th. Would you bow with me, please? Holy and righteous Father, we're thankful that you spared our lives to this hour, that everything is as well with us as it is, that we have a measure of health that allows us to be here and enjoy fellowship with one another. Father, may we focus on our attention today to worship thee in spirit and in truth. You'll be pleased with our effort and we'll be edified as a result. Father, for those that have a public part in our worship this morning, those men that meet around the table, those men that lead prayers, for Brother Johnny, as he leads us in worship and song, for Chad, as he breaks unto us the bread of life, may they have prepared themselves in such a way and lead us so that most good would come from it. Father, forgive us when we fail thee. Help us to always strive to do what's right. We're most thankful for thy son, his willingness to sacrifice on our behalf, thy long-suffering grace and mercy toward us. Continue to watch over and care for us. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship now and stand and sing number 446. I cannot today let the morrow may bring if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord and the rule forever in thing and all power in his vein. Living my faith in Jesus above. I know. 
Supper this morning, number 279, 279. Thanks for the bread. Dear Lord, as we come before you once again on this beautiful day, 
this first day of the week, that we recognize the anguish, the suffering of your son Jesus as he was nailed on the cross. This bread representing his body, help us to partake of it in a manner representing his death. Help us to remember, help us to ensure that his life lives in us. Well, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. overlooked in the serving of the bread. Let's approach our Father in prayer again. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time. We ask You to bless this fruit of the vine which represents us Christians, Your Son's beloved shed for us. May we do so, may we protect this in a manner well pleased in Thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Did we overlook anyone serving the fruit of God? Let us give thanks for the offering. Dear Lord, as we approach you once again, recognizing that upon this day, the first day of the week, the early saints took this collection, and we do likewise. Help us as we look into our hearts that we might contribute gladly and generously to help the operations of your church. Guide us in our gift, guide us in our giving, for we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Number 290, 290, be with me, Lord. <clears throat> sing all four verses. After this, we'll have our prayer. Let's sing out. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I cannot
Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the blessings of this day that enable us to assemble here to lift up these songs of praise before thy throne at this time, to petition thee with prayer, and to study the portion of thy word. Father, we pray that each one of the assembled here prepared themselves for this day, that we'll glean the things that will make us more like thy son, a brighter light to this community. Father, we're mindful at this time for those who are not here this day. We know many are traveling this season. Many are away. We pray that you'd be with them as they go, that you'd bring them back to us safely. Father, we're especially mindful this time of our missionaries the world over that you'd watch over them that they might find success in the preaching of thy word. Father, we're mindful of our shut-ins, that you would be with them. And Father, may we be reminded to care for them as you have commanded us. We're mindful of those who are sick and in the hospital. We pray that you would be with them and be with their families, their doctors and nurses, and ministering to them that their health might be restored. Father, we're mindful of this country that you'd be with our leaders, that you would guide them. We pray that they might have minds and hearts that would cause them to look into thy word for guidance. Father, we pray for the congregation of thy people that meet here, that you would be with us, that we'd study thy word often, that we'd glean the things that would make us what you'd have us to be within this community, that we might lead souls unto thee. And Father, in all these things, when we'd, we fail in these things, we pray that you'll forgive us as we are willing to repent. Continue with us through this time of worship, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Invitation song this morning will be number 5858, if you'd like to mark that. We'll sing at the conclusion of Chad's lesson, number 58. And before our lesson this morning, number 305. 305. <laughs> Anywhere is home. Let me ask you to stand. We'll sing verses 1 and 3, and let's sing out together. Keep the tempo up on this one. Earthly wild and
It is wonderful to be here, and I believe it's been mentioned before, but if not, I'm mentioning it now. <laughs> but we are uh, wanting to extend a special honor today to our two members here who are graduating, Lauren Lloyd, graduating from Alexander High, and Jake Reeves, graduating from Central High in Carrollton. And I have a, I have a note here. I, I, um, Lauren is planning, well, I knew that already. Uh, Lauren's planning to attend Faulkner University this fall. But I appreciate that, Chris, because I'm forgetful. So, um, And I didn't have that on the screen. I got, I got pushed for space. I wanted to put a picture, Lauren and Jake. And I wanted, didn't, ha didn't know how much room I'd have. But Lauren's planning on attending uh, Faulkner University. And Jake, I'm going to make sure I get this right. Jake's planning on attending Southern Polytech, right? Southern Polytech. Uh, this fall as well. Uh, Lauren, of course, is the daughter of our own Alan and Karen Lloyd, and Jake, of course, son of Tony and Joyce Reeves. And we're also glad to have Jake's brother Justin here with us this morning. Um, Jake also, by the way, was salutatorian, or is salutatorian of his class, and, and really just missed being valedictorian by a few hundredths of a point. And that's uh, out of a class of 300 plus. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. I, I, I like to tell people I graduated pretty high in my class when I graduated high school back in 1995. I just say, don't ask me how many people were in that class. I have a buddy that he was homeschooled, and he likes to mention that uh, he, was, he was top of his class. <laughs> and then, of course, we also want to recognize the grandson of our own sister, Lou Overby, Kurt Barrett, who is graduating uh, I believe has graduated just recently from Coast Guard Academy. And so we're honoring our graduates today and thinking of them. And uh, I, I saw this picture you see there at the top of the screen. And it says, now go out and conquer the world. And that's the way people sometimes think about, okay, you, you're, you're graduating. Uh, now go out and conquer the world. And I, I like that sentiment for a different reason. And I, I put this scripture up there. This is the victory, John says by inspiration, that overcometh or conquers the world, even our faith. He goes on and says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? 1 John 5, 4 and 5. Uh, I, I echo that sentiment 100%, but in a, probably a little bit different way than the person who did that picture intended. Yes, graduates, and each and every one of us, we need to go out and conquer the world. Not with worldly accomplishments or physical accomplishments, but with the faith, the faith that is in Christ Jesus, the system of faith, the gospel. That's how we overcome the world. And so we are certainly wanting to extend honor to whom honor today and honor our graduates. But I want us all to notice, if you, you got your hand out, you see that, three keys to a successful life. You know, it wasn't just a few Sundays back I did the um, sermon on th some things you'll never regret. And several people remarked, said, you know, they liked that sermon, but that... Uh, they really wish that, you know, they said that would have made a good one for the day honoring our graduates. And I said, well, yeah, probably so. I didn't, I didn't really think about it. But I said, uh, A, I didn't think about that. B, there's no possible way we would have gotten through that in the Sunday morning short time that we have. And, of course, we're not necessarily restrained by time, but we like to uh, try to be respectful of folks that might be listening on the radio, although it seems like every Sunday somebody calls me or emails or something and says, you got cut off again this Sunday. <laughs> so I'm working on it. But let's talk about three keys to a successful life. And, and really, we, we could talk to, to Jake and Lauren and any other graduate, or, or we could talk to uh, our younger folks that are still in school, maybe even grade school, barely getting to that age of accountability. We could talk, about our, we could talk to our college-age folks. We could talk to our young adults who are right, finding themselves right in the midst of child-rearing and all that goes along with that. We could talk to our empty nesters. We could talk to widows, widowers, and on and on the list goes because these are three very basic keys to a successful life, and they apply to anybody really at any given time in life. But we especially are mindful today of our graduates. But notice, number one, you want to have a successful life, live your life according to the will of God. That's a key. That's number one key 
to a successful life. This was Jesus' first concern. Turn in your Bibles to the book of John. And we're just going to notice a few passages here. And, you know, it's obvious that we could, we could go, even just in the book of John, so many other verses and, and throughout the gospel accounts, many other verses, but just several account, or several verses here in the book of John where Jesus emphasizes his number one concern, his main thrust of his work was to do, to live life according to God's will. Notice John 4, 34. You know the verse. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Well, they say, you know, has anybody brought him anything to eat? And he says, you don't know. That's not, my, my goal is not physical sustenance here on this earth. My goal, my very food, my very sustenance is to do God's will. Then you get over into John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Then you go on into chapter 6, verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now go over into chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Not a person in all of history or in all of time that is yet to come, should there be such, can say what Jesus said there in John 8, 29. I do always those things that please him. But I ought to be striving to do those things that please him every single day of my life. And John 9, 4, again, you know this one. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Night is coming when nobody can work because time will be out. Opportunity will be up. And so Jesus' first concern, it ought to be my first concern, is to live life according to God's will. The goal of every Christian needs to be to be like Jesus Christ, to be as much like him as I can. We've talked about this before, that every single day I ought to be striving to be as much like Christ as I can that day. And think how many problems would disappear in the world and in the church if we would strive every day to be more like Jesus. I mean, so many times we forget about that, we push that to the side, we're not doing that, and we're not patterning ourselves after Jesus. That ought to be my goal. Paul said, be imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Philippians 2, 5 just simply says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 21, for even here too were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. I need to strive every single day to be like Jesus. That's the key to success in life, is to live life according to God's will, striving to be like Jesus. And, you know, if that's my goal, I'm going to want to know more about God's will. I'm going to be more interested in that than I am in my own selfish will. You know, some people, they cannot get their minds off of self. And so they are so caught up in self and doing what they want that they don't know or care about the will of God. But if I'm concerned about glorifying God, doing God's will, living life according to God's will, then I'm going to be seeking it and making that a priority. I'm going to seek his will in relationships. You know, we often talk about this a lot with uh, college age folks as they're, they're graduating. And they're going off to college, you know, thinking about getting married and thinking about relationships and so on and so forth. Well, I need to seek God's will in every relationship. It doesn't matter whether we're talking friendship, it doesn't matter whether we're talking boyfriend, girlfriend relationship. I need to be seeking God's will in relationships. I need to seek God's will in finances. How do I, what kind of steward am I of the blessings that God has given me? Am I, am I contributing to the local congregation? Am I helping others? Am I just wasting money? You know, we, we sometimes think of money as being outside the realm of uh, 
church, so to speak, except when we're talking about the contribution. But really, God has made us stewards, and, and we, we will have to give an account for that stewardship or like thereof. I need to seek God's will in family relationships, in my family life, uh, you know, every aspect of life. But I need to seek to live my life according to God's will in all of these areas. And if I do that, then I'm very much on the way to having a successful life. Let me say this, and I know it's not necessarily popular to say to, among some folks these days, but the key to success is not a college education. The key to success is not getting a, quote, great job, high-paying job, however you want to look at that job. That's not the key to a successful life. And sometimes, if we're not careful as parents, we can lose sight of that. I want to make sure you're going to college. I want to make sure you get that high-paying job. I had people sometimes tell me when I was not sure what I wanted to do for uh, a living as far as for a job, when I was in college my freshman year, I, I thought about being uh, a history major, maybe teaching history because I love history. And so many people say, oh, you don't, you don't want to do that. No money in that. But see, that's not the key to a successful life. The key to I mean, you, you could be a, a ditch digger. You could be flipping burgers. You could be whatever. Fill in the blank that, that the world may look at as, well, that's not really that great a job. But that's not the key to a successful life. The key to a successful life is to live it according to God's will. We're going to notice in a moment, Ephesians 4, 1, where Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Somebody asks me, you'll hear me sometimes carefully word this, because sometimes people may say to me, what do you do for a living? And somebody may say, oh, Chad, Chad's a preacher for a living. No. Let me tell you what I do for a living. I'm a Christian. That's what I do for a living. Now, do you want to know how I provide for my family, what my job is? Well, I'm a preacher. And, you know, it, it, it feels funny to say that it's a job because it doesn't, you know, a lot of times we put a negative connotation on job. But what I do for a living, my vocation is I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. That comes first. And when that comes first, you're living life according to God's will, and that's one of the main keys to a successful life. If you don't live life according to God's will, well, it, it's kind of like I, I read about, and I, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it is, but I read about an interesting piece of art, and it was told for truth. I just couldn't verify it. But this piece of art, you know, a lot of things pass for art these days that kind of make you go, that's not art. But this piece of art was a chair, just an old rickety wooden chair, and somehow the fellow that had done this had rigged the chair up so that there was a shotgun facing, I mean, you sit in the chair and an average height person, you're looking right into the barrel of that shotgun. And the shotgun was set to go off. It was, had some kind of mechanism. And it was set to go off at some point within the next hundred years from when this fellow designed it. And you know what people would do? They would line up by the droves to go sit in front of that shotgun and stare down that barrel, not knowing if it might go off at any time. Now, you can call that daredevil, you can call that, uh, you know, a rush. You can call it whatever you want, but I, I'm going to tell you what it is. And, and parents, if you've got little ones, you may want to cover their ears, but it's just stupid. Now, I mean, it's, brother, brother Curtis Cates would say that is hyper stupid. <laughs> I mean, that is the height of foolishness to gamble with one's life like that. And yet, how many more people gamble on a daily basis with their eternal, immortal souls. You don't live your life according to God's will, and every day of your life, it's like staring down the barrel of that shotgun, and it may go off at any moment, and life is over. That's a key to a successful life. Second key to a successful life is to live your life with commitment. Live life with commitment. Again, I would say this to any age person. I would especially say it today to our graduates. Live your life with commitment. So many people nowadays, they don't, they don't have any concept of commitment. They don't care about commitment. And, and, I mean, in, in many areas of life. I'm not just talking about spiritual areas. But live life with commitment. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, the daily necessities, shall be added unto you. 
Folks, that's commitment. When I'm putting God first, when I take care of spiritual things first, when they take priority over physical things, secular things, that's commitment to God. You know, we've got to be committed people. My primary commitment should be to glorify God. In Revelation 4, 11, he says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive power and glory and honor. He goes on in that latter part of that verse, and he says, For uh, all things were created by him, and for thy pleasure they are and were made. My primary goal in life ought to be to glorify God. 1 Timothy 1, 17, I don't know, do y'all sing it in a gay he, the song that goes to this verse? Uh, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. I learned this at Camp McCroy a few years ago, and it's another one of those. It's like Galatians 2.20. I can't hardly quote it because you just want to sing the song. But he uh, it, it says, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory and honor to God. Ephesians 3.21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And 1 Corinthians 10.31, Paul says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. My first, my primary concern ought to be to glorify God. That's my number one commitment. You know, we talked about the first key to, to a successful life is to live life according to God's will. And when you do that, that's great. You're on the way. But let me tell you something, folks. Romans 3.23 tells us that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so you've got to have a commitment to God on his terms because living life according to God's will never took away a sin. You can't take away his sins by commandment keeping. Now, is commandment keeping a must? Yes. You know, again, people sometimes try to make an either or proposition here. Well, do I keep God's commandments or do I rely on God's grace? You know, as if he, you, you got to do one to the exclusion of the other. I must keep God's commandments, and yet I must understand that when all is said and done, I'm saved by grace. And, you know, I can be a, a sinner and realize, you know what, I've got to make some changes. I've got to get my life in, in accordance with the will of God, and I can start living life in accordance with God's will, but it doesn't take away a single sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that. And so I've got to make that commitment. The first commitment I've got to make is to become a Christian. We, we, you, you hear the invitation extended if, if you're here before. You hear it extended every time we close out a service. Hearing God's word. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Believing in Jesus as God's son, as the Christ, John 8, 24. Repenting, turning away from sins. You know, he said if you don't do that, you'll perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confessing his name as Lord, Romans 10, 10. And being baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away, Acts 22, 16. Raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. That's becoming a Christian. That's committing to being a servant of Jesus Christ, a child of God, for the rest of my life. I often tell people when I speak to them about obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ and committing to Jesus in the act of baptism, that, that final culminating act wherein we contact the blood of Jesus Christ. He adds us to his church, Acts 2.47. I often tell them, it is the most important decision you will make in your life. Now, second to that, and it's not a too distant second, but it is second, is your spouse, who you're going to live the rest of your life with, because that, is, that affects us in a huge way as well. But there is no decision bigger than deciding I'm going to commit my life to God. I'm going to be his. We sing the song at camp. I know, I know y'all definitely sing that one. I am mine no more. I've been bought with blood. I am mine no more. Commitment to Jesus Christ. But, you know, we also need to be committed to spiritual growth once we become a Christian. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, 2 Peter 2, 2. Later on in 2 Peter 3, 18, he says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I've got to be committed to spiritual growth. I need to be committed to family. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll just look at these very quickly. The husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And he goes on and talks about that relationship and how men ought to love their wives. And that, you know, there's a commitment there to family. Wives being subject unto their husbands. There's a commitment there to family. He gets down to chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So there's a commitment to family there even among children. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. He goes on in verse 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. One of the things that I think is unfortunate is that sometimes when people are graduating high school or even college, we say, well, you know, this is... Uh, you're closing a chapter of your life. And I, I think, I guess there's some truth to that in a sense. You're closing a chapter. But let us never forget, education is not a start point, end point thing. Education is life. And especially spiritually speaking, I'm always learning if I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Parents, you are always teaching if you are spiritually interested if you're interested in the spiritual welfare of your children. It doesn't, you know, it's not like, well, you know, I hope I've taught you well. I, I'm going to push you out of the nest or, or let you out of the nest and, you know, hope, hope you do well. Uh, there are times when, you know, I, I believe it was Dave Leonard that was telling me. Uh, he had preached somewhere and the parents brought their daughter to drop her off at college. And, uh, you know, they squalled and had their goodbyes and all that. And, but the daddy, the daddy at that Sunday, right before they left, the daddy went to this preacher, whoever it was that was telling me this, and he said, listen, if for some reason she's not here, I want to know. I want to know. And so he said, sure enough, a few months passed, and she stopped, show, she stopped showing up. It wasn't coming. Uh, they, couldn't even, they couldn't even really make contact with her. The few times they did make contact with her, she said, yeah, I'll be there. I haven't been feeling too great or something. So he said, I finally picked up phone, and I called her dad, and I said, look, I, you know, I don't know. She says sometimes she's sick, but it, we haven't seen her in about a month. Daddy says, thank you. He was there that Sunday, mama, daddy, and the daughter. And she actually, I believe, if I remember the story correctly, she responded to the invitation, said, I've been negligent. I need to make this right. And the daddy said, thank you so much for letting me know. He said, who knows if you hadn't have respected that request of mine and let me know how far she could have gotten into the world before we were able to take some kind of action. And so that girl, to my knowledge, is still faithful today. But sometimes we just, we kind of turn them loose. And, you know, there's a sense in which once children are out of the house that, yeah, I can't say you're grounded or here's your punishment, but I can still instruct. I am always, always, always going to be their daddy. That'll never change. Nothing will ever change that. And if they completely turn their back on the Lord and they say, Daddy, I don't want to hear it, I'm going to say, you come around me, you're going to hear it. That's my plan anyways. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. I know sometimes it's difficult when we deal with family, but we're always their parents. And education does not have a stopping point. Live life with commitment to family, to their spiritual welfare. Live life with commitment to the home congregation. We already looked at Ephesians 4.1. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, but notice verse 2, uh, or 2 and 3, in all lowliness of mine, um, but verse 3 is what I'm wanting, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The latter part of Philippians 1.27, he says, that I may find you with one mind, standing fast with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He tells that congregation, I want, whether I'm absent or whether I come and see you, to find you, to hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27, if we had more time, we could look at that and see the instructions Paul gives for the unity, the commitment to the unity of the home congregation. Whether, whether our graduates or anybody else ends up here as their home congregation or somewhere else, <clears throat> you need to be with a faithful congregation and you need to be committed to that work and say, I'm going to be involved in this and if this congregation is not successful, it will not be on me. It will not be because I did not work and try my best to help that congregation grow. Life with commitment to God truly is the abundant life. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. When you live your life with commitment in all these areas, I'm not just talking about spiritually to the church, but be committed when you get married to your spouse, if you choose to get married. Committed to your family, whether that be 
extended family or whether it be you, you end up with children of your own, committed to that family, committed to God as a Christian, and committed to I'm going to grow as a child of God spiritually. That's the abundant life, folks. That's the key to a successful life. And then finally, key to success is living life forgiving and accepting God's forgiveness. You know, a lot of people struggle with regrets because they struggle to accept God's forgiveness. We talked about the gospel plan of salvation and how you become a Christian. Some people, they've obeyed that and, and they know in their minds that their sins are covered, Romans 4, 7, and 8. That they've been blotted out, nailed to the cross, Colossians 2, 14. That they've confessed their sins and maybe even as a child of God, you know, 1 John 1, 9 is written to Christians. But as a child of God, maybe I've repented, I've confessed my sins, I know he's faithful and just to forgive my sins. But the struggle so often is in the heart. I know logically that I'm forgiven. But, you know, sometimes the guilt remains and I, I have trouble letting that go. And let's understand that it's okay to recall past mistakes and be motivated. You know, Paul says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I, I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. Later on he'd say, I'm the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 to uh, 16 there. You know, he, he remembered how he persecuted the church. But at the same time, let's also understand that I need to forget the past and move forward. Not that I count myself to have apprehended, Paul says, Philippians 3.13, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward. I press toward the prize the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, you know, he remembered in the sense of not letting it, not letting himself forget where he was and being motivated, but he says in another sense altogether, I've forgotten those things that are behind and I am moving forward. Remember Jesus' teaching about forgiveness. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, he basically says, if you forgive men their trespasses, God will forgive you. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, God won't forgive you. Matthew 18, 21 to 35, you know, 21 and following there, he talks about where he says to Peter, I say not unto you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And, of course, that's clarified in Luke 17, 3 and 4 because he says if he repents. You know, a brother has to make things right. I don't just go around dispensing forgiveness. God doesn't do that, and I shouldn't do that either. But if a brother makes something right, I, I forgive him. That's Jesus' teaching. Be ye kind one to another, Paul says, Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. I've got to be a forgiving person. We must be forgiving people. If we don't, we're hindering our spiritual growth. But let us never forget. This also includes number one. When I have obeyed the commands of God to obtain forgiveness, I need to let that go because God says, I've let it go. God says he has no record of that when it's washed by the blood of the Lamb. Ernest Hemingway wrote a story, and, and in that story told of a, a young boy whose relationship became very strained with his father, and he, he left home. The father finally found him in Madrid, Spain, and he put a note in the local paper, and he says, Dear Paco, all is forgiven. I love you. Please come home. Love your father. Meet me in front of the newspaper office. And the story goes that the next day when it was the appointed time, the father was waiting in front of the newspaper office and there were 800 <laughs> Pacos who were wanting forgiveness from their fathers. You can, you can go through life and I suppose you can have moments of happiness, but if you want success, come to God on his terms, be forgiven and accept that forgiveness and understand God, when he forgives, he forgives freely and fully and he forgets about those sins. And when someone sins against us and, and they make it right, let's forgive them. And even if they don't make it right, let's have an attitude that says, I'm not going to hold this grudge. I'm, I'm not going to be bitter about that. I'm going to give that to the Lord. I'm putting that in his hands. We all want to be successful. If you want to have success in life, young folks, old folks, in between, live your life according to the will of God. Live your life with commitment. Come to God on his terms and be forgiven. 
accept that forgiveness, and extend that forgiveness to others. How successful are you right now? If you're not faithful to the Lord, you can't honestly say, I have a successful life right now. And that's why we extend heaven's invitation. Maybe you need to become a Christian. Maybe you need to get your life right as a child of God. If so, now is the time. Won't you come while we stand and sing to encourage you? God is calling the prodigal, come without delay. Closing song will be number 251, 251. Sing the first and fourth verses of Marching Design. Our closing song will be led in the closing prayer, but we certainly ask you to remain for our uh, presentation of our graduates after our closing prayer. Come with that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. And thus surround the throne. When marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful. Father, we're so thankful you've allowed us to participate in this worship service this morning. We're thankful for all the lessons that have been taught here today. We're thankful for your word that those lessons came from. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll not only be with the two graduating here with us, but the graduates the world over. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that they'll always seek you and guidance in their lives, that they will always make the right decisions, and when they don't, that they'll come to you and ask for forgiveness. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you've allowed us to be members of this congregation. We're thankful to be a part of it. We ask that you be with us until we come back this afternoon in Christ's name. Amen.
As we mentioned, we have two of our own, Lauren Lloyd and Jake Reeves, graduating from high school. And as they, as we mentioned, it's not the end of education, but it's, it is, in a sense, the close of a chapter. We want to present them with uh, a gift to honor this accomplishment. It is certainly an accomplishment to uh, finish up high school, to go on and go beyond that. Uh, you already mentioned, but just by way of reminder, Lauren, daughter of Alan and Karen Lloyd, our own members here, and uh, graduating from Alexander High School and going to be, Lord willing, attending Faulkner University uh, this fall. Jake, son of Tony and sister Joyce Reeves, is graduating from Central of Carroll County High School, salutatorian of his class, attending so Southern Polytechnic this fall. And uh, we want to ask them at this time to come up here, Jake and Lauren. While they are, uh, you know, talking about education ongoing, Deuteronomy 6, beginning at verse 6, comes to my mind. And these words which I command thee this day, Moses writes, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. Teaching our children and Christian education especially is an ongoing process, and we certainly honor them for this accomplishment. Uh, we are thankful for what they have meant to this congregation, and uh, who knows, maybe at some point settling here in the future, and this might be their home congregation. We certainly hope that's the case, but we honor them. Uh, for their accomplishment. You are dismissed. <laughs>